Hello and welcome to the Regulating AI podcast, the show where we bring together global policymakers, industry leaders, and civil society and think tanks to shape the future of AI governance. I'm your host, Sanjay Puri, and today we are diving into one of the most talked about issues in AI, finance, and geopolitics, the release of China's new foundation model, Deep Six R1. The launch of Deep Seek R1 has sparked robust discussions around U.S.-China relations, market impacts, and broader discussion about AI and national security. We are very lucky to have a guest on this episode, someone who brings both policy as well as real-world expertise in international technology and foreign affairs, Anya Manuel. Anya is a former diplomat, advisor on foreign policy, co-founder and principal of Rice Hadley Gates Emmanuel. She's also the executive director of Aspen Strategy Group and the Aspen Security Forum, a premier bipartisan forum on foreign policy. She also served in the U.S. Department of State from 2005 to 2007 as a special assistant to the Undersecretary for Political Affairs, focusing on Asia. And she serves on a lot of corporate boards, including Ripple Labs and HIMSS and HERS, and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Defense Policy Board for the U.S. Department of Defense. So, Anya, really uh, uh, very, very happy to have you to uh, discuss a, the topic du jour. So, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here, Sanjay. Awesome. Um, Anya, you know Deep Seek. R1 has garnered you know, significant attention in not just in the AI world, but also the finance world and as well as the geopolitical circles. Can you uh, tell us what makes this so noteworthy? Why is there so much attention being focused on this? Yeah, it has been stunning how much attention Deep Seek has gotten just in the past week or 10 days. Um, I would start by telling your listeners and viewers that a lot more is unknown about deep seek than there is known and i would actually start by pointing everyone to um a blog post that dario amade put out just yesterday about how anthropic sees deep seek and what they're doing and what they're not doing it's really excellent so i would recommend that to everyone so let me just give kind of what we've garnered what we know um there's an argument out there in the press that deep seek was trained uh, for $6 million. And of course, the biggest models here in the US are costing over 100 million to train. That may be right for one training run. But then when you dig a little deeper, and you look at what, how many chips, how many semiconductor chips they say they had, which is 50,000 chips, that is a much bigger investment, probably a billion dollar investment. And just digging a little deeper into the semiconductor chips, it looks like it was a mix of H100s, which are export controlled. So I don't know if they leaked from somewhere unclear, nobody knows. H800s, which weren't banned before initially, but most recently became banned. So they might have been um, getting them farther, you know, a longer time ago. And then H20s which are chips that are not quite as powerful. They're sometimes better for inference and compute. And those are not yet banned. Maybe they will be. I go into all this detail because so much of the news coverage, Sanjay, has focused on, well, American export controls have failed. And I think that's not really the correct story here. So is your implication, uh, because we are talking the geopolitical aspect, and there are reports that maybe they got access to Singapore for some of these chips, etc., um, that export controls have worked because obviously the slant has been that, hey, we stopped them from getting the high-end chips, so they found workarounds, if efficient workarounds to this. But what you're saying is actually that export control did work or they just put a lot of chips on the plate. And why is that so relevant from a, from whether take it from the US-China relationship, but also from a geopolitical relationship, Anya? Yeah, that's a very good way. I'm glad we're, we're backing up and zooming out a little bit. So um, what the United States has tried to do with export controls on the most advanced semiconductor chips and on the equipment, the tools that make the chips, right? is to 
slow, in particular China, but also Russia and some of our adversaries down in the race towards artificial general intelligence. Now, depending on who you ask, some people think we're way far away from that. Some scholars think we're pretty close, but the concern is that an AI model that performs at the level or better than humans in many categories, especially science and technology, could be a uniquely positive thing for the world, but could also be a uniquely dangerous uh, weapon. And so when you look at the, what the US has done with these export controls, this was always going to be imperfect. I don't think mm -hmm. anyone who helped implement these thought, oh, you know, China's gonna get nothing. This was always gonna slow things down a little bit. Western companies were still gonna have to innovate and run faster. And I think that's still the world we're in here. Western companies will have to innovate and run faster. So let me just ask you a couple of quick questions. One is DeepSeek has put this out in open source along with putting their rates, uh, uh, training rates in there. What do you see, what are the implications of that? And then the second thing, Anya, is, is are we headed towards some kind of a splinter net kind of a scenario where you, there are two kind of different ecosystems that are getting developed. One is uh, the U.S. and China with separate alliances, standards, data repositories. Uh, what is your perspective on that? Yeah, that's great. Those are really good places to go. Let me, Sanjay, if if we mind, before we go to open source versus closed source, mm -hmm. let's maybe have a short conversation about what is there to worry about with AI? Because I think mm -hmm. sometimes it gets either totally overhyped, you know, Terminator, <laughs> or no, really, there's nothing to worry about. We should run faster and look about all, all the economic gains that are going to mm -hmm. come from this. And I think that is true. I'm ultimately an AI optimist. I think mm -hmm. the way that this is going to transform various industries is amazing. You've talked about it in your podcast. You've had lots mm -hmm. of business leaders on. I think we all agree on that. But I see this also from the national security perspective. And here's where in national security, we worry about AI. One is artificial general intelligence, which we've already mm -hmm. talked about, unclear when that's gonna happen. Two, we worry about all the ways in which artificial intelligence intersects with other technologies to be physically dangerous to humans. And let me give you some example. Um, already, these foundation models are almost like having a PhD in chemistry or biology on your shoulder. So mm -hmm. if you're a non-state actor trying to create chemical or biological weapons, this is not like looking that up on Google. This is like having someone help you do it in the lab. That's dangerous. Two, they can jailbreak their own safety testing. So if they're supposed to have these <laughs> um, uh, safety markers built into the model that say you can't do certain things, you want to make sure that the model can't be jailbroken. And from what I've seen, the deep seek model apparently is quite unsafe mm -hmm. and quite easy to jailbreak its own security. That's a real problem. Three, you're worried about how AI might intersect with um, cyber and write very advanced malicious code. You're already seeing a huge uptick in phishing in you know, AI that is just much better at targeting you and getting you to click on that email that you shouldn't click on. That mm -hmm. is just the very beginning. And so those are, I'm just listing some of those to show you. And mm -hmm. then of course, we're, we're worried about unmanned drones, aerial vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. So just for your listeners to understand why we worry about some of these things. Mm -hmm. uh but so we worry about these things. This feels like that the world, I mean, one of the thing, messages that we've been giving to the world is, hey, we've got a responsible technology. Be part of what we are trying to do. Our ecosystem, you'll get access. We'll do it the right way. Now along comes China and saying, I've got uh, the same, if not better, cheaper here's open source, I'll give it to you for free, be part of mm, our alliance. And it seems like, you know, uh, you know, you have these two kind of paradigms going at the same time. 
Is that what is happening and why is that important? Yeah, I think it is a little bit what's happening. And it's important because whether you are a closed model or an open model, I would say, and I think most responsible AI developers would say, you want certain safety features built in and you want them to be, these models to be tested before they're let out on the world. Now, the UK deserves a huge amount of credit here because a couple of years ago, they were the first to, mm -hmm. to set up the UK AI Safety Institute. It tests very narrowly the foundation models for these types of worries that you and I were just talking about. It's not woke. It's not about discrimination, whether you're for or against that. There are other issues with AI, but this is mm -hmm. really narrow, specific testing for national security related harms. The U.S. then followed suit and set up a safety institute, and 10 other countries have followed suit. This is a really positive thing. And if I were advising the Trump administration on this, which, which I'm not, I would say just keep that narrow advance testing, that very narrow national security testing for all AI models, whether they're open or they're closed, and they're only allowed to be out in the world if they have been tested. Now, DeepSeek, we don't think was tested. There are some Chinese AI companies that have voluntarily run through the UK testing, which is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. And so I think this isn't also, it just gets very nuanced. This isn't necessarily China trying to unleash something unsafe into the world. It's just this technology is racing so fast. It's really racing ahead of governments to think through carefully how to make sure we keep the good and prevent the bad. So, uh, Anya, you obviously been in the foreign policy world uh, for a long period of time. Uh, when you look at this, which historical precedents like the Cold War space race uh, can policymakers draw from to manage this new era of AI competition uh, between global powers, uh, especially given you now have a new administration, which literally has been there for a week or 10 days, uh, and this has been dropped in their bucket. What would you say? Look at the history. Is there something that we can pull from? Yeah, it's such a good question. And the terrifying thing is there isn't a really very good analogy. I would say the closest one, which is highly imperfect, would be to say it is as if multiple companies, private companies from multiple countries around the world have at the same time invented nuclear power and possibly nuclear weapons. That's pretty scary mm -hmm. because the way that happened in the 40s, the US got there first and we did something very altruistic that I think the US doesn't get enough credit for. Soon after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, United States officials went to the United Nations and said, we need to control nuclear power. We need to think very carefully about it. It was the Baruch plan, it was never taken up immediately, almost immediately, there started negotiations with the Soviet Union and the US about arms control. Now, the first arms control agreement didn't happen until 1963, but they started talking. And I say all this because it's really time. It's very, very important for the US and China to have real discussions about these issues. And there are some, they're super nascent. The Biden administration did some, what's called track one, government to government. Mm -hmm. There are some track two experts, which is um, efforts, which is sort of experts from both sides. They haven't had, in my view, the ones that I've been a part of, had the level of urgency that we probably need here. But um, I'm all for talking, even if we don't get to a clear resolution or a treaty or something like that anywhere, anytime soon. Finally, Anya, you're very, very busy. So. Last question, what is this message to countries like Israel, India, and others? India just announced that they want to figure out their foundation model, and I'm sure Israel is looking at it with its amazing uh, AI talent, and uh, obviously you see the Saudis and the uh, Emiratis and others. Uh, this seems like a nuclear race that everybody wants to be part of. I mean, you talked about that we need to, U.S. and China need to get together to do this. But what about the rest of oh, the world? To prevent harms. I didn't mean to do it together in the sense right. of debating together to prevent the harms. Yeah. But what about the message to the rest of the countries? Because they are saying, hey, uh, 
we kind of need to get our act together. We need our own deep seek. Yeah. Well, interestingly, I guess my view would be not every country yeah. needs its own foundation model. You just need safe, world positive, well functioning foundation models that everyone in the world can use to build on top of, to build APIs on top of and agents and so on and so forth. And so I like this idea of having some come from different countries, but having them all run through the same narrow safety testing that we already talked about. And I also like, there was an executive order that was put out in mid-January that talks about how American export controls will apply to some of these other countries. And the idea is essentially to have an incentive like if you're mm -hmm. going to be very careful and not give get bad guys the chips or bad guys the models, and if you're going to be safe about your AI development, we, the US and Europe and others will help you develop your AI ecosystem. And I think that's a pretty good, you know, you may tinker around the edges of that framework, but I think that's a pretty good framework. Lure people in to mm -hmm. do the right thing and to have the right values and to have the right safety, and then let's all innovate and go forward. Amazing. Anya, thank you so much, you know, for sharing your expertise and your perspectives on the geopolitical implications of DeepSeek R1. It's really clear that we are at a pivotal moment in AI history and, you know, your insight shed valuable, valuable light for us. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to the Regulating AI podcast. We hope this episode helps you better understand the global forces shaping AI today. And join us for more discussion. Until next time, I'm Sanjay Puri signing off. Stay curious and stay informed. Thank you, Sanjay.